Hi, everybody. This is Robert Hodges, and uh, let's get this party started. I'll be talking about breaking out of the proprietary cage. Real-time data warehouses come to open source. So before I go into the slides, I'd like to give a big shout out to the people who at the Open Source Summit that made this happen. Um, I've done a lot of conferences, and I think um, you've all, of course, attended many of them. It's just a huge effort to get something like this to work in the in the circumstances that we're all facing right now. So thank you so much. It's just a real pleasure to be here and I appreciate everything you've done. Uh, with that, let's dive in. Um, here's my title slide, same thing. So I'm gonna be talking about data warehouses and how a new kind of data warehouse that I call a real-time data warehouse is now emerging in open source. Let me just give you a little bit of background um, First of all, about me, this is a picture of what I look like when things are going well on, uh, on, uh, on, on my SQL examples. I'm CEO of Altinity. We are a software and services provider for ClickHouse, which is the data, main data warehouse I'll be talking about in this talk. As a company, we're major committers to the project. We're also big community sponsors in the US and Western Europe in particular. Um, as far as my own background, I've been working on databases since 1983. Um, plus, I uh, took a few breaks. I was working at VMware for a while on virtualization and security. Um, when I go back and count, I think ClickHouse is number 20, but after a while, you tend to you tend to lose count. So um, it's basically been the main focus of my career, and uh, it's a really, really great subject. And I hope that in this talk, I can I, – transmit some of the enthusiasm I feel about working with data and particularly with data warehouses. Okay. Oh, by the way, I see questions popping up and I just want to give you a heads up that I'm going to make sure that I have time to answer them um, in this, uh, at the end of the talk. But because of the way this platform works, it's really difficult for me to see them coming up and I don't want to screw up the talk by trying to um, manipulate the questions. So they'll definitely be Time to answer them. Please cue them up, and I'll be delighted to answer as many as I can on the talk, and then pick up anything else after that in Slack. All right. So what I'd like to do is is dive in and kind of frame this problem about what makes analytic applications special. Because in this track, we've talked about uh, different kinds of databases. In fact, if you saw Am Amanda's talk a few minutes ago, she was just scanning the whole. Uh, environment of, you know, sort of the panoply of different kinds of data uh, databases that exist. And what we're going to be focusing on today is databases that are specifically designed to do analytics. And these are <clears throat> basically answering um, in the, when it first emerged, they were answering rather general questions about uh, business problems. And I'm giving a simple example here of just sales data. And imagine that it's organized in a table because we're dealing with relational databases. They're concerned, they're, they, they like to have things in tables. And you can ask general questions about sales data that can then help you drive company strategy um, and um, even make, in some cases, real-time decisions about how you should react to things going on in the market. So let's just take one of these questions. Um, which kinds of companies are most likely to buy SKU 556? So that's some product number. And what we're trying to ask is, you know, why is it that why is it that somebody buys this? When do they buy it? Can we can we understand their buying patterns? Because that would allow us to, for example, pick companies to market to, maybe give them special offers, maybe have an inventory uh, positioned in particular places. These are all questions that these are all things that come out of having an accurate answer to that. And when you go back to the table that contains the data, it quickly becomes apparent that this answering this kind of question is very different from just querying a table in a database like MySQL. And I'm going to give you three differences that, that, that make this problem qualitatively different and therefore require a different technical approach. So the first thing is that when you look at an individual sale, there's just a, an enormous amount of data related to that sale that you might want to know. We have the part number, but what's the name of the product uh, that, that corresponds to 556? We have the date, but we could be thinking in terms of, of weeks or months or years, things like that. So we want to have different, different levels of time. 
Um, we have the city, but what about geographic regions? We have the customer. What about the industry that they belong to, the country where the headquarters is located, things like that. So you can see that there's an enormous amount of data that you need to effective to have at your fingertips that allow you to adorn this simple sale and then have more context about what was going on, where and how, when this happened. The next thing is looking down the table is the data values could be, the number of data values could be enormous. In sales data, it actually tends to be kind of small because it's generated by humans. But in a lot of analytic applications, the data is actually things like people's locations off their cell phones or where they were clicking on a, on, on a web screen. We're talking trillions or even quadrillions of rows of data. And then the final thing is to answer these questions. We need to be able to take this very long, uh, you know, sort of very long list of records, this very wide range of data associated with each record, and we basically need to be able to combine it in any pattern imaginable. We call this slicing and dicing. So so there's no particular, we can't make an assumption about what the access pattern is on the data. The person who's asking these questions and trying to get solutions could look at the data any way that pleases them. So these three things became apparent to people starting in the, um, in the, in the 1980s, and they led to some really interesting uh, innovation to create what we now know of as data warehouses. So there were basically three, looking back in the history, there were basically three um, sort of rounds, I think, if, uh, if you will, of technical, uh, technical advances. So the first one was sort of set up in the 1980s, but really became apparent in the early 90s with a couple of products, uh, Sybase IQ and Teradata. So the first thing that the people did was they said, hey, we've got a lot of data what we'd like to be able to do is process it on multiple hosts. And this is something that uh, Teradata did, spread the data out, be able to multi, uh, multi uh, you know, sort of issue a query that, that breaks, that, that attacks the data on each machine and takes advantage of more computing resources. So that's MPP enabling. There were things like column storage and bitmap indexes. Uh, I was actually working at Sybase when we acquired IQ. And I remember hearing a talk from a guy called Clark French about, hey, these, this is a new kind of business problem. Here's how we have to cluster the data, basically load it in columns, use bitmap indexes, because this is a different kind of problem. And he, you know, we, we sort of dimly realized at the time, hey, this, is a, this, this really does require a different technology. The next line of advance, a couple of advances came in the, between 2000 and, and 2010. And that was with products like Vectorwise and, and Vertica. So things like being able to vectorize the execution using SIMD instruct or SIMD instructions, being able to reorganize, have different organizations of the same data. That was an innovation from Vertica. And then of course, things like uh, compression. And then the final, the final um, uh, sort of set of, of technical innovations have come over the last decade and with the advent of the cloud. And just to, to name one, Amazon Redshift was a groundbreaking product because what it does is it took these data warehouses, which are complex software. You often had to wait months uh, just to get the hardware for them, let alone get the software installed on it. And basically the, the Redshift team made this happen within a few seconds. You go to a, a, a screen, enter a few clicks, you know, tell you know, what side of the database you want. And within a few minutes, you have a data warehouse spun up that you can build begin playing around with that. So these are all um, sort of profound innovations and, and sort of in each, in each area demonstrated enormous creativity to try and answer these questions more effectively. However, the solutions all had a single unifying or the, the, the people working on them all had sort of a unifying characteristic. And you know, if you're an open source person or, or, or a database person, you look at this and you may, it may just jump out at you. These are all proprietary products. So this was this innovation, particularly early on, but extending up into even to today has been driven in large part by innovations on proprietary products. And in fact, when we look at the open source competitors specifically for data warehouses, again, sort of these are relational databases with relational model, um, sort of tabular data designed to move, uh, you know, answer quite general 
open-ended questions very, very quickly over large amounts of data, there's actually not that much out in the, um, in the open source that's a direct competitor. Um, I'm going to give three examples here that, that illustrate the kind of technology. There are others, of course, but I think these give you a sense of where people were going. So, for example, uh, there's Presto, which was originally developed at Facebook. It is designed to do query over data lakes. So large collections of data, for example, living in object storage or living on HDFS. Um, that's one solution that's out there. Not really a direct competitor to the um, to the data warehouses, but but SQL based and 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 focused on the problem of large amounts of data. At the other end is Druid, which is a uh, popular uh, open source uh, uh, system that's designed to handle queries on large event streams. So things running into dr uh, uh, trillions or quadrillions of records, um, and it was innovated, uh, particularly innovative because it it was able to throw a lot of hardware at the problem and guarantee a certain level of latency. So this is this is a, a definitely a, an interesting technology, but it was not actually originally SQL. And then in the middle, what I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk is a database called ClickHouse. And this was a ground up SQL implementation to get, to get quick answers on structured data. So it started out as a relational database um, it was originally developed at Yandex. The, the first prototype of it was, uh, was done in 2008, and it was open sourced under the Apache Tool license in, um, uh, in 2016. So what I'm now going to do is shift away from history, and let's look specifically at what makes these databases um, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, particularly powerful. So. Let's um, let's just look at the at the key features of ClickHouse. And the way that I like to explain ClickHouse for people that aren't familiar with it is, hey, imagine that MySQL, which is a very very popular open source database, and Vertica, which was one of the the databases I mentioned, those proprietary databases I mentioned in the data warehouse field. Imagine they got married and had a baby. Well, that baby would be ClickHouse, and so from the MySQL side, you get a simple, uh, simple operational model. So ClickHouse is just a single C++ binary. Uh, you can basically install it and get it running in about 60 seconds. It's about the same speed as installing and bringing up MySQL. It has SQL language. Of course, we get that from both parents. Um, it is open source, and it's relatively simple to run. From the, from the uh, Vertica side of the house, we get things like shared nothing architecture. So we have a bunch of computers, each with their own storage, uh, but don't have shared file systems, uh, don't have uh, you know, sort of complicated uh, uh, networking architectures. It, it's a relatively simple and easy to understand architecture. We have column storage with high compression and codecs. We'll talk about that in more uh, detail. We have vectorized query execution, and then we have MPP enablement. Basically, being able to split the data up into shards and replicas. So that's coming from the uh, conceptually from um, from Vertica, and then the whole thing is really fast. So everything in when we when we think about ClickHouse, we're using column storage. We think of everything as either a sequential read or sequential write, and there's a huge number of optimizations that are built into the product as well as along with product features that allow us to get answers very very quickly. And that's what I'm going to jump into next. So that's your basic overview. And then um, now what we can do is dig down into ClickHouse itself and understand um, how it works and what makes it fast. Before I do that, though, I want to talk a little bit about what it's not. Because every time you solve a problem, you're making choices about problems you're not going to solve. So what doesn't ClickHouse do? Well, it's not an ACID compliant database like MySQL or Postgres. ClickHouse has a transaction model. Um, it deals with large chunks. Basically, the transactional unit, if you will, is, is a large chunk of data called a part. But it's not focused on things necessarily like isolation, like um, although it, it does support it to a certain extent. Um, it, it's, it, so it's not, um, uh, not completely ACID, ACID compliant, and it also doesn't um, deal with things like updates particularly well because it makes the basic assumption data is immutable. 
What else is it not? Well, it's not a distributed key value store. So if you have a large number of, of um, you know, of sensor values and you want to go to each one individually and, and visit them and see what they're doing, something like Cassandra is probably better. Um, it's not a highly concurrent cache server like Redis. So if you're storing session data for, um, uh, for users, ClickHouse is probably not the product. And finally, and this is really important when we look at, at direct competitors in the, in the data warehouse space, it is not, it, uh, full SQL, complete SQL compliance is not the main design point of the system. It is speed followed by uh, having enough SQL that you can get the job done and also feel comfortable working with it. So for example, things like window functions, which you may be familiar with if you work with analytic databases, they don't, ex they don't exist yet in ClickHouse, although we're, we're working on them. So what we do have though is speed. So um, let me just talk about the code. This is sort of a sort of an eye test. I want to just focus on a couple things. Basically, ClickHouse is some of the best C++ I've ever seen. Um, it's actually readable if you if you've used. I'm not a C++ programmer, so don't anybody uh, hammer me. I've mostly worked in Java, Go, and and Python, um, but. The code is, is really readable. It is very well-written code, and it's ex there's a huge emphasis on optimizations for speed. I'll just give you a simple example. When we talk about group by, which is the SQL construct to do aggregation, ClickHouse has 14 algorithms for doing group by that are specific to data type. So we're always trying to choose algorithms that are best suited for the data, the type of data that we're dealing, and its distribution. And you'll see that constantly throughout the code. In ClickHouse, there's no one way, for example, to do a hash table. There's a bunch of different algorithms for hash tables, and, and we'll pick one according to what, what particular use case we're solving. Another really important um, uh, feature of ClickHouse is vectorized query execution. So basically, as you'll, you'll see this more, but we basically focus on breaking up data into pieces farming out the process to every core and every hyper thread on those cores and doing that as efficiently as possible and where applicable applying S, uh, SIMD instructions so that we uh, single instruction multiple data so that we can basically get multiple operations done in a small in, in a smaller number of machine cycles so I'm not going to go deeper into this but if you look at the code it's it's filled with interesting optimizations and there's some great talks on how this works that you can check out now, turning to stuff that's visible to a user, we have a table type called merge tree. And one of the interesting things about ClickHouse, at least to me, because I worked with MySQL for a long time, is ClickHouse uses table engines. So if you've used MySQL, you, you probably remember these. There, there was InnoDB, there was MyISAM, there was Falcon, you know, a bunch of different table types. Um, uh, MySQL, Follow, or excuse me, uh, ClickHouse followed that uh, that design pattern partly because the the folks that wrote it were very familiar with uh, with MySQL, but it's used much more broadly. So there's about 40 different table engines, and they all do something useful. They're they're basically tuned to particular work cases. The number one table engine is called Merge Tree, and it's really the uh, kind of a family of actually it turns out to be a family of tables of which one. This is an example of a table. So it's a create table. If you've used SQL before, this looks fairly familiar. Our data types are a little bit different from ANSI SQL. But then you have these, uh, you have these uh, extra things at the end of the table. First of all, defining the engine. So it's merge tree. Uh, giving us a way to partition the data because this is a table type that is designed for very large amounts of data. We want to have a way to break it up into parts. And what this SQL is saying is take the date, this is flight data, as it turns out, flight on time data, and break it up by month. And then finally, within those parts, how to order it. And we're going to order it by the carrier and the date of the actual flight. So, so this is something that you see visibly. And then what happens when the data is actually implemented, what we see is that you'll actually go to the file system and you can see parts which consist of what we call a primary key index. It's a sparse index. I'll show you the structure of it in a minute. And then all the data is present in columns. So we store the data as, as highly compressed arrays. 
And those arrays are sorted on the order by columns. And the index gives us the ability to find particular rows and group them together so that we can take the, you know, if we have to, um, if we're referring to like three columns, we can, we have a way of finding out where they're located in each of their individual arrays and getting the data, get the data consistently. So that's the basic high level layout. And you can see this on the file system. When you actually go to one of the directories that contains this, and one of the cool things about ClickHouse that I really like is that this is all visible. It's kind of like MySQL um, uh, where you can just go and, and um, not with the InnoDB table, of course, or InnoDB table type, but uh, with my ISAM, you can just go and you can see all the data lying around on, on disk. Uh, ClickHouse is very much uh, follows that and you can see, ex you can basically see all the structures. And what you see when you come in is this primary.idx file. And that's, a, as I said, a sparse index. It's not, it's not used to maintain data consistency in, this, in the way that a primary key would be in Postgres or, or ClickHouse. It's used to find things. And it's sparse in the sense that we only have entries for every, say, 8,192 entries. So what that means is we read data in chunks. And the lowest resolution that we're going to get in a query is we're going to read about 8,000 rows. You can change this if you want. That's called a granule. And then to actually find where the data for the columns is located in, in, each, um, in each of these uh, columns, we have what are called .mrk files. And these are just uh, an array that matches that primary.idx. And they contain offsets into the actual column data. And each of those offsets is a chunk of compressed data. So compressed block that's, that's also um, may have some additional transformations on it. So this is your basic uh, structure. Those blocks are called marks. Um, and as I say, they contain a, a, a compressed block of data. And you can just bounce in and start reading at that point and, and then um, bring the data into memory and begin processing it. So this structure is, is really important. It's super efficient because it minimizes the amount of data we store in storage. I'll show you some examples of that. And the other thing is it means that, hey, if we're only talking, if we're only looking at two out of 100 columns, we actually only read those columns and then only the parts of those columns that we think are relevant for the query. So <clears throat> there's a, um, oh, looks like my, I uh, got a little bit of trunk. So, ClickHouse is very focused. Constantly queryable. There's no, you don't have to stick stuff in and then wait a while for it to be, to be available. What ClickHouse does is when you insert data, it you typically do it in blocks. It's common to do, you know, say 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 rows in one block. And what ClickHouse will do is it will insert it and create a part. And so when your insert comes back. Your part has been added to the table. It's now queryable. And this is optimized to be pretty quick. You can, the, the ingest rates are very, very high because what we're doing is creating this part. And you can describe this as kind of a fast but half-hearted organization because the part might not be very big. Um, you know, and, and so when we're actually doing the queries, we might have to read a lot of parts if we just took the data as it was inserted. Well, ClickHouse takes care of that by doing what are called background merges. And that's where the name of this uh, table type comes, is that what it'll do is it'll look at the parts. And over time, small parts will be coalesced atomically into larger parts so that what will happen is your, your queries will run much faster. And the difference of, you know, sort of when you aggregate these parts together, it can make order like an order of magnitude difference in your performance. But it's, it's something that happens fairly quickly. and. So your initial data is not organized as optimally as it can be, but then it, it quickly is merged over time, you know, merged into this, this more efficient structure. So that's once again, where the merge tree comes from. And this is really fundamental for getting high performance. <coughs> so the, um, and speaking of performance, the first thing you can do when you're trying to make things fast with ClickHouse is just add CPUs. It's very good about everything is by definition parallel. By default, it'll use uh, it'll it'll grab half the cores that it can see. So anything that's in uh, proc CPU, um, the uh, but there's also a setting called max threads, and this is just a simple example of a query on this flight data where I've set the max threads, that, and these are actually hardware threads as it turns out, to be two, four, six, and eight. 
and then just check the query response. And what you can see is with two, when you go from two to four threads, it pretty much cuts your response in half. Adding more threads doesn't really help because in this particular case, you get, you're seeing some Amdahl effects that we're not just scanning the data, but we're also doing some aggregation that has to be done at the end where we have to uh, do that in a, in a single thread. But you can basically control the performance very well using this. And this is the first thing I do when, when I got something I want to make it run faster, just add more CPUs and ClickHouse will, will use them efficiently. The other thing though that you can do, and this is where you really get the big, the, the you know, huge impact is to minimize IO. When, you know, when you're trying to make databases fast, the less they have to go to storage, the, the faster they go. And ClickHouse is actually quite efficient about this. So for example, this is an example of a query on the left, again, on flight data, where I'm looking at canceled and delays, delayed flights. And what I've done, oh, this is interesting, um, so part of the little bit of the data is missing in this picture. Um, what we can see in the query responses is that if I put no filter on this query and have to read everything, then I end up basically reading all the parts and all the chunks of data, the marks we call them, um, in the table. So I get a certain query response and that's the, the no filter part of the graph. If I, um, uh, you know, if I only restrict it to one year, I'm going to read less data, and if I restrict it to 40 days, I'm going to read even less data. And what this graph is showing is that the query performance and the number of marks that ClickHouse thinks it has to read are pretty much pretty much track linearly in this case. And what's missing from this is there's a nice uh, uh, picture here that actually showed the, which you may not be able to see, it showed ClickHouse demonstrating that it knew how many marks it was reading, and that's actually how it collected this data. So when we're looking at, at, at optimizing ClickHouse performance, we're going to do things to reduce, we're, we're always going to be focused on reducing the amount of data we read. How do we do that? Well, a good way is to improve compression. So, um, uh, okay, once again, we're missing some data here. I, I apologize for this. It looks like, um, it looks like the way that this is showing up. Uh, let me explain what you should have seen here is um, we're adding codecs. So ClickHouse has LZ4 and ZSDD compression. You can choose them generally. These compression algorithms have no knowledge of the data. So LZ4, which is the default, if ClickHouse can see data, it's gonna try and compress it with LZ4 if, if you don't tell it anything. What you can do though, is you can add codecs, which are transformations on the data that would, um, you know, that actually, um, you know, change the, uh, change the values. So, um, and they are type specific. So for example, one of the things that I can do, and that was uh, shown in this A under bar LC, is I can use dictionary encodings. So if I have a bunch of strings like airport names, I can actually apply this, this transformation. And instead of storing the airport name, it will just store an integer, which vastly reduces the amount of disks that's, that's inside. Let's go ahead and look at the graph. So what you see is this actually a dramatic effect on storage size. So um, the low cardinality encoding, that's what I was describing there, uh, will reduce the data uh, significantly. So, it, and basically the, the benefit here is that it, it, compre it, it reduces the data size before we even try to compress it. So we end up, once it's com fully compressed, with 89% compression rate. Actually, this was using LZ4. If you go with S ZSDD compression, you can get it down even lower. You can get like 93%. And similarly, we have a bunch of different numeric encodings that you can apply, like delta encoding. What's the difference? You know, where basically all we do is store the difference between numbers. Works great if they're increasing. Um, or we can do double delta. We store the difference between the numbers, actually the difference in the change in the numbers. So if they're slowly increasing, this is optimal. And the actual uh, results you get in terms of storage, it, it makes a huge difference. So, um, so, so basically, this is one of the key tools. Another tool that we use is to uh, create materialized views. And once again, apologies, we have some um, stuff missing from this. The slides will, will show it. But the basic idea with a materialized view is we're going to just reduce the amount of data that we read by applying a transformation on the source and putting the reduced data in another location. This is an example of a materialized view that 
the um, where the CPU where, where we're basically asking for the last value of, of CPU usage uh, on a bunch of measurements on CPUs. So it basically allows us to take a table instead of scanning the whole table to find out what the last value was for each CPU. We can collect that information in the in the in the in the uh, materialized view, and basically um, we get a, an effective compression ratio that's that's enormous. We end up with far less than one percent of the data, and as a result, the queries are orders of magnitudes faster. Um, a very common pattern here is to use this for um, uh, you know to. Uh, to aggregate data. So for example, you have a website, you're doing web analytics, you want to track hourly unique visits, hourly sessions, you keep those long-term and then there's a, um, a, uh, a feature in the, you know, in the table definition where you can add a TTL. ClickHouse supports this. It's um, unfortunately not showing on this slide, uh, but basically it deletes the data after seven days in this example. So you keep the source data for seven days, that's your detail, but then you keep the aggregates forever. So this is really um, efficient way of using storage. And then what we can also do is um, ClickHouse has a feature called tiered storage. And what this allows us to do is within that source table, we can also have different qualities of uh, different types of storage. So for example, we can use NVMe SSD for the, for the data that is, has just arrived. We can put a TTL on the table that will then say, hey, move it from my hot storage, because NVMe is really fast, suitable for the, you know, the small percentage of queries that you're looking at most commonly. After a certain period of time, like two days, move it off to, um, to a hard disk. And, and we can also group those. Uh, you, can, uh, you, know, you can raid them yourselves. ClickHouse also understands raid patterns and, and can do it itself. So this is a really uh, an increasingly common pattern and actually something that we worked on uh, quite a bit over the last year or so to, to implement. Beyond single um, uh, ClickHouse servers, we can, of course, cluster them. And this gives you the horizontal scaling. And basically, sharding is built in. So you, and a shard is a portion of data that, um, like a, you can think of the data being divided up into disjoint sets, like, you know, groups of tenants, for example. Um, you can also replicate it. That's that's also built in. There's multi-master replication, and what those what that does is allows you to get more concurrency because there's more copies of data that you can use. So as we look at this, we see the um, uh, you know and how this is actually implemented. Well, ClickHouse uses more table engines. So for example, we have a distributed table engine that understands how to uh, take the parts of the table, or excuse me, the, a bunch of replicas divided up into shards, and it knows that when it receives a query, it should pick one replica from each shard and then uh, bring, the, bring the data back together. Um, when we do, when we set these clusters up, one thing that clicks, uh, we have to add to the architecture is Zookeeper. Uh, that's something that we are looking at how that can be, can be eased, but that's an extra piece that is added to the system because you need to have consensus about which parts have which replicas and, and how they're moved back and forth. So what this, what the distributed table does is it then allows you, what you typically do, the common pattern is you have the distributed table on every, um, on every node, an application can connect to any node, run the query against the table, and then the distributed table automatically distributes the, the queries down to, uh, down to the local copies. So, and there's various options that you can use to make this more efficient. But the basic idea is to do a push down where you get as much of the query as possible to run on the local select or the local local data and then the and compute aggregates locally and then they come back to the initiator which merges them together and hands them back to the application. So this is um, is a really powerful feature and for good queries, so well-behaved queries, and um, and when you set things up properly, you can actually get linear improvements by adding um, additional nodes. And this graph shows a couple of runs on, on this airline data, in a case where we're just doing a pretty expensive query. Um, 
the cold data and the hot data are blue and red respectively. So that's, you know, with caches and caching enabled and without. But in both cases, you get essentially linear performance with by adding nodes. So it's a really powerful feature. And what this means is that for extremely large data sets, we can, for example, split them up over um, 50 nodes, uh, for example, and, and thereby get uh, vastly better performance than we would if we were running on a single node. So that's ClickHouse uh, internals. I'm going to just talk about a couple of patterns of use to uh, kind of close things off, and then we can then we can take some questions. So um, a really common way that ClickHouse is used is together with Kafka. So ClickHouse can ingest data very fast. If you go look at published um, uh, published articles, for example, Cloudflare wrote a really widely read blog uh, post about about using a ClickHouse, and they talked about how they get uh, what, what is now about 10 million events per second coming into their cluster for all their web analytics, DNS, and service logs. Um, they, they use Kafka to, to drive this, because Kafka is able to, like ClickHouse, can scale horizontally and allows you to, uh, to have very high, to, to basically share enormous amounts of data and ingest them quickly into, in, uh, collect them and ingest them quickly. So, and a pretty common pattern is to just write your own uh, consumer. So you write a, you know, write some little Go programs that read out of the, um, you know, read off the topics, turn around and hand it to ClickHouse. But ClickHouse also has a cool feature, which is there's a table engine that makes Kafka topics look like a table. And and this this is actually a kind of a cool example of the creativity that uh, behind both table engines and materialized views. So the table engine encapsulates the topic and it looks like a table <clears throat> and you can select off it. And what that will do is remove whatever, you know, so it'll basically read it from the topic. Well, you don't want to do that manually. So what you can do is actually have a materialized view, which is constructed on the table. It automatically selects and then puts the, um, you know, puts the uh, values in a different location. In this case, in this example, into a merge tree table. And so basically what that does is gives you an automated transfer out of the topic and into the merge tree table. So this is, is, um, is also another way of, of, of integrating with Kafka. And I would say actually overall, probably 50% of all people that use uh, ClickHouse are, are integrated, um, are, are also using Kafka as a way of ingesting data. Um, another pattern is visualization using Grafana. So uh, the ClickHouse uh, integration with, with Grafana is quite good. There's a Grafana a plugin that, uh, that actually we maintain um, and, and I play around with constantly. Uh, what we're looking at here is actually some of our uh, 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 data from our Amazon cost billing, which we of course stick into ClickHouse, but we serve it up in Grafana. And so Grafana is written in TypeScript. Uh, there's a ClickHouse plugin which uses uh, one of two major interfaces in ClickHouse. It's an HTTP interface. It can just uh, do gets or posts to run the queries. There's also a wide number of, uh, of other client types, uh, Python, Golang, C++, um, uh, and then, of course, JavaScript, Java, curl, things like that. So, And there's also, um, I, I should mention, there's a really great uh, – command line client is called ClickHouse Client. It's super good. It's like MySQL or, or PSQL if you're uh, familiar with uh, MySQL and Postgres. Really handy to use and, and easy to load data. So there's one final use pattern that I think is interesting to talk about, and that's running on Kubernetes. So ClickHouse is not cloud native exactly, but it's fair to call it cloud friendly. And the reason it's cloud friendly is it's just a single, um, it, it is a single process. So it's easy to put, it runs really well inside Docker or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever container technology you're using. And it has a relatively simple relationship with storage. So uh, what, what, one of the things that, that we've worked on for actually now about a year and a half is building an operator for, uh, for Kubernetes that allows you to set up clusters on Kubernetes. And this, this is a very common pattern. Um, just about every other major database, particularly in the open source world, has, a, has an operator for Kubernetes. The ClickHouse operator allows you to 
define your cluster in a single file. It's called a custom resource definition. You feed it to the operator. And then what it will do is go look at that and say, hey, you need a cluster that contains, in this case, uh, you know, like one shard and three replicas. It'll go allocate the, uh, the, uh, uh, the storage and start containers to, uh, uh, to access it and then put a nice load balancing service in front of it. So this is an increasingly uh, common pattern. We, we have a number of customers and there's um, many people outside our customer base that are using this. Uh, and the cool thing about it is it basically allows you to have a lot of, of, of uh, data warehouses because you can spin them up and, and blow them away pretty quickly on, on Kubernetes. So it means each service can actually now have its own uh, data warehouse. So that's a really exciting development and I think something very different from uh, from what we see in the, um, you know, across the, the, you know, in the proprietary databases. So just as a wrap up, um, ClickHouse is, you know, sort of first off, it, it's really the first data warehouse, SQL data warehouse that, that meets or beats the proprietary offerings in head to head comparisons. And the place where it shines, as I said, if you're looking for a complete SQL implementation, probably not the first stop. It's better to go uh, pay Vertica the money. Uh, but if you're looking for speed and cost efficiency, it definitely uh, it, it definitely fits the bill, and that's why most people are using it for one of those two reasons. The second is the feature co coverage is expanding rapidly. So we're working on the SQL features. Like a big thing that's going in is uh, role-based access control. Complete implementation matches uh, what MySQL does. Nice things like object storage, uh, stuff like that. And then I think the final thing is because of the scaling, ClickHouse has this interesting property that it can deliver reliable real-time performance. And there's a couple of metrics that, that we see commonly. One is to shoot for ad hoc consistent, uh, at one second ad hoc query performance, um, and you know for those analyst queries. And then for things where you're driving, like uh, you know online applications like MarTech applications, 10 millisecond predefined query response. There's a bunch of people using ClickHouse to get these response levels. Um, and it, it does this very effectively. So here's some resources. I'm going to pass over them. Great documentation, a lot of good talks. Uh, we do a blog that, that covers some of these general issues. And I just want to say thank you. And again, once again, big shout out to the Linux Foundation. Uh, you all have done really wonderful. I'm really, really happy to, to be able to present. Um, it wouldn't be a real startup talk if I didn't say we're hiring. And, and here's... Uh, you know, sort of ways you can contact us. And in the middle is ClickHouse. Don't believe me. If you haven't used it, don't believe anything in this talk. Just go get it, try it out, see if it works for you. I mean, this is open source. And, and if you see something that, that you don't like, hey, give us a PR or submit an issue. Uh, we're, we really, the, the community is already enormous and international. We love to have new people. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and look at some of the questions. So, um, okay, uh, I had a question here, and I'm just going to take them in, in um, let's see, we've got, oh, i got a good, okay, I'm just going to run these questions until I run out of time. So, uh, data, the question here, are those data warehouses I showed in the, uh, in the initial um, uh, picture, are they similar to SAP HANA? Uh, yes and no. One of the things about HANA that's, that, is distinctive is HANA actually stores stuff as rows and then goes to columns later on. It's also use it makes heavy use of of in memory uh, database. So it is a proper data warehouse. Many people use uh, use it for. I'm not that familiar with the architecture, uh, but it it uses the, the the innovations I described at the beginning of the talk. They are well known. In many cases, they're decades old. So. The stuff that I showed there, you there, you can be sure that most of it is is being used in HANA at some level, like compression, for example, or Codex. So, what are your thoughts of, on Delta Lake, which sits on top of Spark? Um, it's complicated. That's my thought. This is the this is where um, what and one of the th one of the big reasons that people use data warehouses uh, is that they are simpler than. Uh, than building stuff through pipelines. I think the that Spark is a, is really really powerful and has excellent ML integration, 
But the thing that's nice about ClickHouse is that you can connect it with Kafka, ingest your data, and just instantly answer questions about it along with all the previous history that you had. So when you're trying to get, you know, when you're trying to get quick answers to uh, to big problems on top of structured data, data warehouses are definitely the way to go. And in fact, if you want guaranteed latency, I don't think there's any substitute for actually having your own storage format that organizes the, the data in a, a consistent way. So that's that's kind of my basic thought. Um, the, these are alternative technologies. If, if you have enormous amounts of data and you don't care how fast you get the answers, yeah, something like Spark works. Uh, if you have smaller amounts of data, and I, I, you know, say 20 petabytes as opposed to exabytes, then uh, ClickHouses and data warehouses in general are a much better approach. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Let's see, there's a question. Given query performance, the fact you can immediately query that you inserted is a good fit for the query portion of the CQRS pattern. Uh, I don't know what that pattern is. Uh, for interactive user experiences, read from ClickHouse and transact with the system of record. Actually, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but there's kind of an interesting, um, I, I think that what you want to do is think in terms of databases that serve a single purpose. So if, um, you know, if you're doing transaction processing uh, in MySQL, like doing sales, just have them be there. But I wouldn't want, I, you wouldn't typically want to have an application do something in MySQL and then read from ClickHouse. There's just too many ways it could get screwed up. Where ClickHouse is really going to help you is if, is if you have a data source that's like, you know, behavioral data uh, from marketing, you know, like what they've done on different websites, you just stream that stuff straight into ClickHouse and it bypasses MySQL completely. Um, let's see, what enterprises use ClickHouse? Cloudflare, uh, Cisco, uh, I'm just trying to think of the people I can name, Comcast, uh, Yandex, of course, they invented it, um, MessageBird, uh, I don't know if they're still using it, but they were early adopters, uh, Spotify, so a bunch of people, and I'm just naming the ones that have talked publicly about it, there are many, many more, uh, including a lot of people in financial services. Um, can the Kafka table engine enable us to serve real-time online use cases as opposed to just analytics use cases? Yes. So uh, typically you can achieve ingest, you know, sort of uh, time to query uh, of 500 milliseconds. It really depends on how, you know, you have to make sure that Kafka is well-tuned, but that's why Kafka, one of the big reasons why we like Kafka is it's not just the scalability, uh, which of course Kafka is wonderful, but it's also the fact you can get stuff really fast. So that is, in fact, a, an important use case. And what, where I think this, you know, if I, if I could, you know, contrast this, for example, what Confluent is doing, if you talk to Confluent, what they would say is, hey, we should, we should run, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, KSQL on, um, on the query stream as it's coming through. Yes, you can do that. But in a way, it's just easier to dump it as fast as possible into the data warehouse and just query the whole thing there because you're not just looking at the stream. You have all your data. And moreover, you can partition it in ways and store it in ways that mean that the most recent stuff is hot and you can get at it really fast. Um, how does ClickHouse speed compare to HANA? I don't have numbers on that. Um, so it is much, much, it, it's definitely much faster than Redshift, faster than Elastic for use cases that are well uh, suited, but I don't have numbers on HANA. Um, when would it be a good idea to choose ClickHouse over DBs like Postgres? Great question, when you have a lot of data. And in fact, what happens is people, um, Mux.com uh, is an example of a company that started with Postgres, they started with one, and then they made it bigger, and then they, and they brought in Citus. And then they had, you know, like a big Citus uh, distribution. And finally, they gave up and just put it all inside ClickHouse. And the reason is that, that with ClickHouse, they could just throw the data in and uh, basically be able to, um, to do their queries without a lot of complex pipelines, aggregation, things like that. Okay. Um, I'm just looking back. I want to make sure that... Uh, uh, I think I got all the questions if, uh, let's see, I'm just checking that I didn't miss any. 
Great. So um, if, uh, if there are no further questions, we'll go ahead and close this up. I am available on Slack if you want to uh, post additional questions and you're interested in this. I'd love to answer them. I do hope you'll try out ClickHouse. It's open source. Um, just one last pitch. I think it's other than Sybase, which was probably my favorite favorite relational database, uh, ClickHouse is uh, the most interesting database I've ever worked with. So uh, definitely try it out. It's really accessible and is a very, very welcoming community. And once again, thanks for the third time to Linux Foundation for making this talk possible. Uh, hope to see you all in person soon. Thank you very much.